because you will, will do your stuff individually. So the 85th, I mean, is this really going to be about red meat issues, or is it going to be about substance food issues? My guess is some measure of both. Uh, but I can tell you this, I was just talking um, to Rika, Rika before this, and, um, and you know, last session were resources, and I've advocated for people with disabilities during resource-rich sessions and resource-poor sessions, and you know what, I do just as well in the resource-poor sessions. So it's a false hope to say, well, we gotta wait for better times to ask for stuff. You can, you can make in, improvements and move this world into a better place. And not all of the things we advocate for will be money deals, but yes, there will be money deals. So our mission, very simply, people with disabilities should live, learn, work, play, and participate fully in our community of choice. Everything we do, every bit of legislation, every appropriation support that mission. If you could boil it down into a single word, I would use the single word, access. And I will bet that even one of our guest speakers you can categorize it as access, access to medicine, access to community services, access to parking spaces, access to employment, access to education, and more. It's all about access, which is a civil right. You know, this is way too difficult to see. I'm going to pass over it, but we do a number of different things. We do we have an arts division. We have our advocacy, advocacy division, which is us here. We do uh, social entrepreneurship and direct services through consumer direct services, and we do community organizing around the state. This is the three of us who will be our primary guys in the capital, but I can tell you this, we have a culture at CTD. If, uh, let's see, Aaron, Aaron are you here, Aaron Jones, where are you? Okay, Aaron is here with us today. So she works in our CBS office. And you know what? If there's an issue that comes up that she has a personal connection to, like, in fact, people with high needs living in her home because she supports her mother living independently, I'm going to call on her and anyone at CTD is on call to do advocacy. I would encourage you in your organizations to not say there's just advocates, but that everyone, everyone in your organization, if the shoe fits, Make that shoe be an advocacy shoe. All right, our main issue, and I got a couple of shout outs. Kathy Cranston with the Personal Attendant Coalition of Texas. You're somewhere, a tremendous leader on this issue. This is the base wage for community attendance and Bob Kafka on the ADAPT team, all the ADAPT team. So in your, in your packets, is an independent study. This is our formal release today. It's an eight-page independent, fully documented study on this issue. And basically the issue is our community attendants, who are the most important people in keeping seniors and people with disabilities in their own home, struggle. Struggle with an eight-dollar base wage, with no benefits. And when I say no benefits, I mean things that we don't even think of as benefits, like if you take Christmas off to spend it with your family, or you stay home with a sick child to get paid. No, they don't get any of that. That is their entire conversation. And it's been inching forward over the years. Last session, that resource first session, we got a 14 cent raise, which you know what? That was a nothing more than an insult, really, frankly. We're looking for 10 50 an hour in year one of the biennium, 13 in year two. And I don't think there's anyone that thinks $13 an hour with no benefits to take care of people with disabilities in their own homes, seniors in their own homes, too much money by 2019. It sure is not. You know why I know that? Because, because I went out to, uh, what's that place? Bucky's, Bucky's out in Bastrop, which is the gas station and convenience store where you walk in. It says, our starting pay is $13 an hour. In here, they'll talk about some of the pay at McDonald's, Target, Kmart, all these kinds of places. This striking graphic here, the high water mark of pay for attendance was in 1968. And if you adjust that to inflation, you'll see a significant decline. In other words, the real pay of community attendance has eroded by 30% in these decades, 30%, okay? 30%. That's a huge number. No wonder that workforce is about to collapse. By the way, there are more and more people who are going to need this. And uh, 
All you have to do is look at this report and see the TWC analysis of it. By the way, TWC identified the 10 highest demand occupations for the next, I think, until 2024. The top, top demand occupation was community attendance. And in fact, that number exceeded the combined total of all other high demand occupations. Let me repeat that. The growth in the number of tenants needed will be higher than the growth of all other high demand occupations in Texas combined. Okay, waiting list, another thing. Yeah, this is this is one of Texas's great embarrassments that they have so, so many people, and it increases again and again and again. Now 212,000 people for Medicaid waiver waiting list. That means they might get something, they might get nothing, but you know what they're not doing? They're not choosing to go in an institution, which they could do. Institutions are adults. So these are people that need to be supported in the community. HHSC wants to have 19,000 slots. I mean, that's okay, but you know, point out here, this number here. In the last session, they approved 23,575, so they're backing off they're backing off what they asked for two years ago even. Still, waiting list is very, very important. Oh, by the way, back to that wage thing. Last, in 2015, HHSC proposed a wage increase to $8.86 an hour. This session, they're only proposing $8.50. They've actually backslid on that issue, too. So this is what you, these are the kinds of things you need to know and why these are worth fighting for. This, however, is a fairly good deal. Promoting independence, CTU will be pushing hard. These are people at immediate risk of institutionalization. Oftentimes, a, a, a caregiver uh, passes away or can't do it, a family caregiver, or there's some other situation where it looks like they're going to be institutionalized. This, this is like the emergency community place, placement. Great deal. We're pushing for it. Um, that's $50 million. Oh, by the way, I notice in the LAR, I wonder if y'all have noticed this, that sometimes they'll say the cost of something, and they don't tell you how much money is being saved. You know what? There may be a cost to doing something, but there's always a cost to not doing something. And you know what? If you don't give these emergency community placements to people that are heading to the nursing homes or ICS or state-supported living centers, the cost will be far, far higher. So we're pushing for this idea. Let's have informed decisions. Okay, it's gonna cost you 50 million, but it might avoid 150 million, 200 million of other costs. So these are smart appropriations we talk about. Okay, this is one that we talked about by Judy a little bit later, but this is an example of um, uh, what I call poor proposals. HHSC proposed cutting the $5 million in contracts and supports to help people move from nursing homes back to the community. I'm glad that Mark Gold, who is, who is really the individual most responsible for a lot of this in the state, becoming the nation's leader in relocations for nursing homes back to the community. This is a key piece, key piece of it, HHSC cut it out. You know what? It's amazing how few people they need to successfully relocate to make back all that $5 million or more. So Judy's gonna talk more about that later. Early childhood education, Chris is gonna talk about that. He's our kid specialist and doing a lot of family stuff. Um, there's a couple smaller things. Lifespan rest, respite helps people, family caregivers. It's a half a million dollars to zero that out. It's critical help. Uh, in home and family support gives people $100 a month for things like home modifications for picking up a few extra attendant hours. Zero down, and we love the clubhouse model of mental health care support. And that's just a couple of minutes. These are very high, high return, low cost programs that we're going to pick out. And you know, I encourage all of you also not just to look at the big issues, but find those small, important things that can make a world of difference to those families. Finally, uh, in our continuing work on protecting the civil rights of seniors and people with disabilities, we're going to be pushing for the Office of Court Administration to get funding to actually monitor guardianships in the state. Believe it or not, they do very, very well about this. So with that, I'm going to turn this over to Chris Macy, our family and kids guy. I've got it. Okay. Okay.
Can y'all hear me okay on the lapel mic? Mm -hmm. yeah. Excellent. Okay. I'm not here in Canada. <laughs> so, did y'all read yesterday in the Chronicle, it's a year of the kid? Did y'all read that? So I guess the last decade and a half is the year of ignoring those kids. And so that's what I'm going to talk about. And I think most of y'all know that I'm a parent with a child with a disability. And as much as I hate wearing that on the sleeve sometimes, I think it's important to understand if I get a little uh, passionate about these things. The attacks that we've had and the constant neglect and cuts and budget cuts, I think really came to a head last session with the Rider 50 Medicaid therapy cuts. And many of y'all were involved in trying to make sure that this didn't happen, whether that was legally or by uh, your, your advocacy. Uh, the rates did occur uh, late December, and hopefully we'll get those uh, restored. And that's what we're asking for, is that the Medicaid therapy cuts were restored in the supplemental budget. Now, we hope that that occurs in the supplemental. If not, we're going to work very hard. And of course, it's not just about restoring the cuts. It's about maintaining those funds through the rest of the biennium. Uh, we absolutely have to ensure there's access to therapies for kids. And I'm going to talk about ECI in a minute, but early childhood intervention, but this therapy cut actually affected ECI in some ways they weren't expecting and hurting access. I don't want to talk a lot about child protective services or mental health because in our role at CTD, we're just going to help our partners a lot and be there for them. But we know that there are lots and lots of kids with disabilities in child protective services and in foster care. We want to make sure that we're there to say, on behalf of those kids with disabilities, that they don't get lost in the whole CPS discussion, that we need to decrease these caseloads, that we need to address foster care. We're also going to be working on mental health. I was very fortunate to uh, go to the, the Hall Policy Fa Foundation's uh, Policy Academy and learn a lot about mental health issues and really about trauma-informed care, about transition services and how important these things are. So we're going to be there helping our partners to have a stronger voice. And ECI. Well, thanks, Stephanie. Will you raise your hand? Texans Care for Children did an absolutely wonderful report. You'll see uh, a good portion of our recommendations are actually mirrored off the OS document. Uh, there's a couple of others that may be a little bit different. I want to point out the amount of money that it is to maintain the caseloads with the LAR proposed exception line number six. It's not much money. It's not much money to maintain these caseloads, but that absolutely does not expand any type of uh, eligibility toward the pre-2012 levels. Eligibility was cut. It was cut a lot. When I received ECI services, my son got more than folks who are getting them now. As a parent, I will tell you those ECI services are absolutely crucial. I thought I was a good parent. I learned differently. I also learned from experts on how to trick my son to do things that I would have never thought about and that I hadn't even experienced with my 11-year-old typically developing daughter. So we're very passionate about making sure ECI gets to families. We're also talking about increasing the eligibility because if we change, uh, pardon me, if we increase, expand eligibility, we have to increase funding, right? It's that simple. Um, and I learned this recently from talking with the Easter Seals folks that contractors now have an administrative burden that wasn't and didn't exist in the past that has actually pulled away dedicated staff. They've had to take and make staff do paperwork rather than having them uh, dedicated to child find and to ever transition coordination. And I think that's reprehensible. We know that administrative burdens are something that our current uh, administrations don't like, yet they put an administrative burden on these ECI contractors, and we want to eliminate that. Well, especially, uh, how do I even start this topic? Um, especially for the group in here. So, uh, you know, Disability Rights Texas, y'all, uh, we were there at the beginning when all the, the Houston Chronicle article came out, um, sitting in a room at TEA listening to, uh, I think it was uh, cameras in the classroom, and it was devastating to learn that so many peers of my son had not received special ed services, that this arbitrary cap had been put in place, that kids were being denied services, and after going through all the listening sessions, myself here in Austin, and seeing the literally thousands of parents with their first opportunity to tell someone what had happened to their children or not happened, uh, so, so it goes, uh, it, this is a real big deal, and it is simply not enough to get rid of this 8.5% cap. 
It is absolutely the base level, thank you, the base level thing we need to do. We've got to restore services. We have to have an action plan. We have to address some of these systemic failures. Yes, it's gonna take some money. There's no doubt about it. And what else did I put up there? We have to have stakeholder input. I, I don't think many parents felt like they've ever had an opportunity to tell someone about their personal story and their child's denial of services or what they had to go through. You're smiling, I see you show. There's a couple bills right now, those bills uh, eliminate the cap. Uh, that's all they do. And we've got to work harder for more. So I hope that any of y'all are interested in child issues uh, can make sure that we not just get rid of this cap, but move forward. It's your turn. Just stay on this side, Chase. Oh, I don't get a podium, I, I guess, guess we're well, the Texas Works Commissioner. You can just yeah. move it. Yeah, yeah. Podium. Uh, we're yeah, gonna that's 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 arrangement. Of course it's gonna break. So now I, I have a few notes. So this uh, session, I know one of the things that's going to be big is just working together. Um, last session, we talked to many legislators on the back side. And one of the issues that they had talked about was that we don't all work as a collaborative team. So I think that's part of why we wanted to start having on those Fridays kind of a happy hour to get groups together, just to talk shop and to talk about what they're hearing and to uh, support each other more, even if it's just going in and signing a card. Uh, I think that's something as a group we need to do more of, because uh, the bigger we are, the louder we are, the more we're gonna get done, especially this session. Uh, some of the issues that I'll be working on through CP is transportation. I think that's something that for the disability community that's, it, there's been a big need for it, and it was lacking in certain areas. Uh, some of the things we worked on in the past was distracted driving. We'll be working with Representative Craddock and uh, Senator Zachary again, along with others, uh, to kind of really focus on this. For the disability community, you know, there's always that idea of trying to cross, especially downtown, some of these streets. People are texting, they're not watching where they're going. Um, it, it creates a hazard for a lot of people. Um, those that are visually impaired talking to us about not feeling as safe crossing the streets. So it's something that we've been working on for a while, uh, last session. I was asked to come in and speak during one of the hearings. And I had the opportunity to meet uh, two young men and their sister. Um, they got up to testify. I didn't know their story at that time. And I thought they were there with their parents. When actually they were there testifying uh, due to a car crash, they were both paraplegics in wheelchairs from the accident. Their sister had been um, injured very badly at the time. And both of their parents had been killed. They were living with family. So that was just from a simple test. And I think that's something that, you know, as our community, we're always seeing it, how it affects us right now. Um, but it's also adding numbers, and there's a lot of people out there that just don't take the time. Um, so distracted driving will be one of the things that we focus on. Uh, another, something I've worked with Mac and many of you in here, accessible parking. Uh, I know the Governor's Committee did a report this session on some of the issues and some recommendations. CTE has a few recommendations we've been working with others to try and really craft something that goes along the lines of education and really getting the violators to understand how they're affecting people, um, how that's going to make you know, other people's lives harder and how it's, we can increase the access to the bike, you know, going to work, going to uh, school, going out to the grocery stores, how we can get better access and how we can do it um, without changing too many of the laws, but just reinforcing and really putting focus on this issue. Um, some of the other things we're working on is with uh, transportation network companies, you know, Ubers. That's scrambled all over the state. It's different in every town. Uh, something that there's a lack of is accessibility. Um, we've been, we've reached out, we've worked with a few of them when they were here in Austin before they left. They were running a pilot that was you know, it was very useful and actually worked just like anyone else. You know, popped open your phone, you could see where the cars were, you could catch a ride and get where you needed to go. And it worked perfect because it included you just like anyone else. Um, that's not offered in every market. That was a pilot here. Um, something that's kind of in the big fight right now is are we going to just one state regulation over them? Or are we going to stay with local control in all these different areas? If that's the case, we need to be part of this discussion. Um, if it goes to one big state regulatory program, 
if we did things as fully we want and the growth in there, then we actually have consistency across the state so that if I fly in Houston or Dallas, I know I can get the exact same access I have in Austin. That's something that's lacking already when you're looking at Houston cab companies. So I think at the end of the day, no matter what you decided, local or state control, we need to make sure that accessibility is one of the starting points of this discussion, not the end product of saying, well, let's add on a few more here and go from there. So we'll be trying to play a bigger role in making, having that discussion. And we invite any of you, because many of y'all's groups will actually be affected by this at some point. There's a lot of benefits to be gained as we move forward and bring in new technology. We just want to make sure that we're at the table when that happens. Uh, some of the other issues we've been working on, economic disparity. Our group has some of the highest unemployment rates, and we want to work on that. We want to find good jobs for people. We want to get them where they're upwardly bound and not just going into a job for life if they get one, not being paid sub-minimum wage. We want to work hard at actually finding good careers for people and giving them the same opportunities anyone else has. That way, if you want to come off of any kind of state services, you can make enough of a living to do that, or you can find a good living wage. Um, right now, one of the things we've worked on for years, I think since I got here, is trying to add the people with disabilities to the hub certification. There are a lot of benefits to adding people to hub. It gives them the chance, the opportunity to get into contracting, use their entrepreneurial skills, which we're finding in our community, is probably one of the best business uh, models you can go into. It allows you the accessibility you need, allows you to create the plan around how you, know, you want to forward. And also, we've always noticed that people with disabilities tend to also hire people with disabilities. So it's a way to kind of bring more people into the program. Um, over the years, we've been told that you know this too many people will join, and we don't want to have people in there we want to keep it the way it is. I think that's kind of a false uh, attitude. We need to really look at it and see how we can improve this community and get them more employment. And uh, in the past, the uh, what was it? Employment First Task Force had made a recommendation after we had talked with them to add this in last session and we pushed again. So we'll be doing that fighting for again this session. Any help we can get, um, we'd love to have. I think uh, the last one that on mine is we've been doing a lot of work on prescription drug access. I think there's going to be some others talking about that later today. Um, but the main goal for us is access, making sure people get the right medications at the right time and that you don't have barriers in your way to getting that care. And if there are, that they're reasonable and that everyone can see there's transparency and that people can move forward with what they need. So we'll be working a lot in that area and uh, I'll let some of the others talk more depth about what we're going to be doing. Thank you. You might mention the Gila Monsters. This is the third time we've had the Gila Monster in. I think he's becoming our spirit guide or <laughs> mascot or whatever you want to call it. We now have partners that uh, have a chance to move this around a little bit. And I keep getting in front of the camera, sorry. That's fine. <laughs> you know, that's what they're doing. Okay. So let's just look at the Eagle Monster and prescription drug as our prescription drug mascot. Oh, in the past we had to work uh, on some different pieces of legislation. They found out that that was part of how they were making some of the new meds was uh, for organic trade. And they were using the Eagle Monster saliva. And all of a sudden that was his main stepping off point every time we were talking about <laughs> biologics. Was, it's the Eagle Monster and it was just Open up all kinds of doors. Amazing <laughs> with a little bit of computer. I guess that's what I got with it. That's, that's, that's a true story. Once we started calling it the Gila Monster Bill, we got a lot more traction in the offices. <laughs> so these kinds of things do work, a little bit of creativity. So we're about to launch into our partner initiatives, and so I'll ask those who come to speak to come up sort of about here and we'll adjust so you can be Facebooked. So You'll notice we said, you know, 10 to 1. So there's going to be about 11 or 12 of these partnering initiatives, each about 5 to 10 minutes, I think. And then the idea is we finish before noon or slightly before noon, and the rest of the time will be informal networking. So, you know, if you heard something, you want to talk to somebody, you want to follow up with anybody else, you can do so, have another cup of coffee. 
you know, sometimes we find it, and this is kind of why I guess why we're thinking about this hand power stuff, is we spend so much time working so hard because there's so much collective work that needs to be done. We don't have those little pauses where you can exchange information that means so much and help us all work better. Okay, so, and Colleen Horton with the Hog Foundation for Mental Health will be first. for mental health and the foundation has been part of the University of Texas for 75 years and was founded by the children of Governor Hogg. Um, obviously we focus primarily on mental health substance use issues but we do have some significant overlap with um, the disability community. One of the things that we have really focused on for many years is around the mental health workforce. I'm sure if you have any connection to the mental health world that you know that there's a critical workforce shortage across the disciplines. So we have focused a lot of our policy priorities. We have policy priorities instead of legislative um, issues because we are part of the University of Texas. We can't lobby, but we do work very closely with advocates, state agencies, and, and um, legislative offices when we requested to help improve um, mental health services in Texas. For the past, I don't know, five to 10 years, there have been numerous um, studies, interim charges, reports um, generated through legislation to address the mental health workforce. Unfortunately, even though there have been numerous recommendations and ideas of ways to address it, uh, last session we had one piece of legislation that passed that um, addressed the workforce, and that was Chairman Schwartner's um, loan repayment program. Now, it was a great bill, but it is not going to fix the problem. So, a lot of our recommendations that you'll see in this packet that I gave you. Um, do address access, but access through, um, they need to ensure that we have the workforce to provide the services that we need. So one of the things that we see as a priority is around um, increasing access to peer support services. We, it is an evidence-based mental health model of care that um, takes advantage of the the gifts and talents people with lived experience of mental illness or substance abuse have, along with their um, training and accreditation to really help other people work towards their recovery. We have um, a lot of peers working in the state. They, the services are not defined the, um, in statute or in rule, and they are not reimbursable under Medicaid which limits where they can work and who they can assist. So one of the things that we have been working with Chairman Price and a number of others is around really understanding the value of your services, but also understanding what we need to do to really improve the opportunities for people to um, receive those services. As I mentioned before, there's been a lot of um, studies and, and recommendations around mental health workforce, but we don't have a plan. We, we piecemeal and have, we put band-aids on and <coughs> pass one bill or two bills a session, we think, well, we address a problem, and we know that that's not working. <coughs> so um, one recommendation we had to the um, Mental Health Select Committee was to create a strategic plan, identify short-term, mid-term, and long-term goals on how we're going to address this workforce and, and stop trying to fix it by band-aids because we know that doesn't work. Some other workforce recommendations we have um, offered to evaluate and improve mental health reimbursement rates. We know reimbursement rates throughout Medicaid are inadequate. To look at it and evaluate reciprocity and scope of practice. Reciprocity is people coming from other states being able to use their license or 
become licensed in Texas because of their work experience and the kind of licensure in that state. Scope of practice, as we know, always becomes um, a huge issue in our state whenever you talk about it, but we need to start looking at maximizing people to um, really be able to use their license to um, benefit people, especially when you have a workforce crisis in rural areas where you don't have psychiatrists or you may not have any psychologists. We need to make sure we're maximizing the licensure of the, of the professionals that we do have. And um, another issue is obviously expanding the use of technology around um, telehealth and telemedicine. <laughs> One, um, I'm not sure, I imagine if most folks know that there was, uh, Speaker Strauss did appoint a select committee on mental health to look very comprehensively at the mental health system, which they did over the last interim, and the report was released just last week. Um, a lot of us are waiting our way through it to see what's in there, but there's a lot of good recommendations. And one of those is around something that the foundation has worked on for, for a number of years now, and that's really addressing the mental health needs um, and the trauma-informed care needs of people with intellectual disabilities. Too often, we, um, for this population, we focus on behaviors, behavior interventions, behavior plans, and we never um, really approach the idea of does this person have a mental illness? Does this person have they experienced trauma that's affecting their um, impact to cope in the world and so it results in behaviors? And so the foundation has done a number of things um, over the years and we are hoping that the legislature will really address access to mental health care. It is very difficult to find um, psychologists, psychiatrists, social workers that will provide mental health services to people with intellectual disabilities. It's not rocket science, but people are often fearful that they don't have the skills um, or, or the expertise to provide these services. So we really need to put the training, put the education out there and make sure that we provide reimbursement for true mental health and, and recovery for people with IDP. Um, integrated healthcare has been a big issue for the foundation. Our executive director, Dr. Martinez, has been chair of the Behavioral Health Integration Advisory Committee. They have a long report that they put out. We have started a new version with Senate Bill 58, um, but primarily what we have done, except in pockets around the state, is integrate the funding streams. We haven't really integrated the healthcare. Um, behavioral health and physical health care. So I think if you're interested in that issue, there's the report from the advisory committee with a whole host of recommendations in there. As far as uh, mental health funding, which is always an issue, um, we would like to see consumer-directed services developed in mental health. I know it's been part of the disability world for many, many years, but we really don't have consumer direction available in the mental health world. And it would provide so many opportunities for flexibility for people to get the mental health supports and services that can really help them um, toward, towards their recovery goals. Um, we really would like to see the state look at the 1115 waiver projects, identify the ones that have had good outcomes. There's uh, over 400 1115 waiver projects that deal with behavioral health in some form or fashion. And so we think it's important that we take the time to analyze the outcomes and really try and replicate the ones that are making a difference. Um, mental health parity is something that will be um, addressed this session. Chairman Price and several others are interested in it, um, which by federal law, mental health is supposed to be on par with physical health. Um, even though it's in federal statute, there's really very little to no monitoring of it, and so there's um, nothing to ensure that it's being enforced. Um, and we have quite a bit of evidence that it's not. So we want to, both in private insurance and public Medicaid managed care, we want to ensure that parity really does become the norm for services. And finally, there's a lot of talk about the state hospitals being um, replaced or repaired and an extraordinary amount of money that it's going to take. And 
we hope that the legislature looks at more than just the number of beds we needed. We hope that they really look at the continuum of care and don't create a plan just for replacing beds or adding beds, but looking at what all the options are and what all the needs are. Um, step down the units, um, more community-based um, residential services and that kind of thing, but to look at the whole picture and not just determine how many um, psychiatric beds we need. So, so that's, that's it. it. Thank you very much. If you have any questions, find me later. Thanks. Thanks, Colleen. Some of our strongest partners are the Center for Public Policy Programs, and I'll go for our next speaker. Oh, that's a mic. That yeah, might be here. You just turn on instead of having to hold that button that the telephone to click that. Dennis, you probably answered this at the very beginning, yeah. but I may have missed it in uh, very repeating. I really want y'all's slides, the CTV slides, so I can pretend to be as smart. And so will those be made available to us all? Well, if I could be as smart as you, Ann, I'd, I'd be further down the road in this work. But yeah, yeah of course. Of course. Oh, great. Okay, wonderful. So uh, I'm Amanda Alford with Center for Public Policy Priorities, and I'm going to try to kind of just zip through the big sort of messy ball of issues that we'll try to have our arms around, you know, related to health care and disability services uh, this session, and then hopefully leave more for questions and discussion later. Um, before, um, for when we were just, when it was just after the election, we were just trying to sort of quickly get a grip on how do we edit our legislative agenda document to reflect the new landscape. Uh, this is kind of the list that fell into my health and wellness team. Uh, and then I'll mention a couple of things that fall outside of it that are relevant to this work. So uh, we had already been concerned about the need to defend Medicaid and shift uh, against additional cuts. We've already talked about the therapy. Because uh, as an example of that, obviously there's a there's an even bigger, uh, more existential threat to Medicaid and CHIP uh, with uh, the the uh, federal election outcome, and I'll touch back on that. We're also I'll be working on, on looking to defend against any um, attacks on access to health care for immigrants in Texas. You know we have a big bowl of folks who are lawfully folks who aren't lawfully present. Those two groups, it's not me, but <laughs> those two groups have different issues, obviously, in terms of accessing health care, but there, there are issues there. We saw some very direct challenges to their access to care last session that we weren't really looking out for, so that we'll be keeping an eye out for that. We'll be looking to support um, continued and hopefully improved access to family planning services uh, and women's health services. Uh, we don't know to what extent legs will develop underneath any discussions about expanding the ability of mid-levelers to provide services. If they do get some legs under them, we'll try to be supportive of that. Um, it's not really clear yet where that's going. Uh, we'll be keeping an eye on, and it's less likely to be legislative than administrative, but we will be continuing to keep an eye on our eligibility and enrollment systems for public benefits and for health care. Uh, everybody here who works with populations with disabilities has probably dealt with half a dozen different kinds of chronic <coughs> problems of people who should be getting Medicaid, should be getting waiver services, getting dumped off of their care. Uh, like if, they, if there's just some error that the Social Security Administration does, if they have a five paycheck month, all those kinds of things. So we continue to work on that. We are concerned about you know, trying to do what we can to not see an abrupt cutoff of our 15 waiver funding for Texas, um, because for if, if for no other reason than that, that's where half the hospital payments are coming from these days. And so, you know, if we have a dramatic disruption of that, it will be, a, you know, a huge safety net issue for all of us and from every constituency. Um, we don't know if there will be, uh, because of the, you know, and the fact that uh, things that used to be disapproved, disapproved by CMS will now be approvable under a new administration where there will see renewed interest in getting to some kind of coverage program for our working poor adults in Texas. 
but if there is any movement on that, then we'll certainly be trying to engage in that and, and lobbying for you know policies that make it meaningful coverage uh, and, and aren't problematic for uh, working for adults in Texas. Um, we will be continuing to work on what we hope will be some more pro uh, progress on the problem in the commercial marketplace of surprise uh, medical bills, uh, not just in the ER, but in other kinds of hospital settings. Uh, and there's some reason to think we'll make some more progress on that this session uh, because it's become uh, essentially a problem that any every other person you know who's been hospitalized or going to the emergency room has had one, and so it's sort of widely understood by legislators that there's a there's a real issue here. Um, we will be continuing to contribute, uh, along with a lot of other people in this room, to the ongoing work that Colleen alluded to on mental health parity. Uh, I will give you a, a slight preview of what I'm about to talk about, which is one of the reasons we all have to have at least sort of a sketchy list in our heads of all of those arcane things that were in the Affordable Care Act that we may not have been thinking about the fact that, oh, we didn't have these if not for the ACA, is that mental health parity did not apply to small group markets or to individual health insurance coverage before the ACA. So a full repeal of the ACA means a huge chunk of mental health parity disappears. So we'll return to that and some of these cross-cutting issues that we have to keep around. But it just means the work that's being done here by people of good faith and some really great partners uh, in the form of elected officials, that anything that Texas can do to create some strong state-based standards is going to be really important with so much uncertainty at the federal level about whether we're going to even have federal standards that we can rely on going forward. Um, Colleen, we will support the work that Colleen teed up about peer support and criminal justice. We no longer have our resident expert, but we have a wonderful hog fellow who's going to be tracking that and will try to, to keep a, a toe in that work and, and be supportive of it. I uh, just want to make you aware that I've got people on my health and wellness team who are also working on food stamps, what is Cal now called SNAP policy, and we've also been looking hard, uh, a little bit of a cross cutting with some of the reference to kids with disabilities in foster care. We, there are also about 250,000 children in Texas living with grandparents and other relatives, most of whom aren't getting any support from the state at all. So we're gonna be continuing to work to elevate their voices, those grandmother voices, and see if we can get the state to move forward and actually providing some support uh, for those uh, caretakers and those kids. Um, so the cross-cutting piece is how does all of that fit together? I had a reporter ask me what are going to be the top three things to think about about Medicaid um, in the upcoming session, and I said, well, the first one's always the budget. We always have, a, you know, we have had for 15 to 20 years, the agency has been told you are not allowed to ask for what you're actually going to need. You have to pretend like there's not going to be any price increases or inflation, and then we will ask for that chunk of the money you need as an exceptional item. And so that's part of the uh, routine, and I. I don't have the number in front of me, but I want to say it's around 1.7 billion GR for the biennium for that item alone for Medicaid. So that's always a big deal, getting Medicaid fully funded, or at least adequately funded to where they don't make program cuts uh, is, is a huge big deal for us every session. Um, I think, you know, I told them, keep an eye on the discussion of the therapy uh, policies and rate cuts, because it was a two-part thing. That's, even though, compared to the whole Medicaid budget and even compared to that exceptional item, that's a really small amount of money uh, in Medicaid terms. It's a big deal. It's a really good example of uh, how the budget policy works and doesn't work, the budget process works and can go wrong. Uh, so I thought that that was a very important thing to understand. And I did the math on it, and I believe that the GR amount of the therapy rate cuts is like one half of 1% of Medicaid spending in any given year. And, and I think that that's important for us to all understand because cutting out one half of 1% of Medicaid spending for a really critical service uh, for a population that really needs those services creates some serious disruption and potential harm to kids and other people with disabilities who need those therapies. So, you know, it's, it's a, it should be a cautionary tale for all of us about how important it is if we think this is bad Think about what a block grant or even potentially a per capita cap type approach, if not, well, could do. And we'll get back to that topic. Um, and uh, I think the other third thing that I said to this reporter is there's huge uncertainty about 
um, whether there will be a space that where the legislature and the leaders will want to move forward to uh, in tandem with whatever the discussion in Congress is about Medicaid going forward. Uh, so we don't know whether there's going to be an obvious state action uh, that needs to be taken or that they will feel compelled to take in order to be in step with congressional proposals. And if that sounds completely incoherent, let me step back and say, for example, Speaker Ryan's proposals, which have not become law, they haven't been filed as legislation, but he's put out these proposals. One of his proposals is to tell all the states that they get to choose between whether they want a Medicaid block grant or a Medicaid per capita caps funding system. And Medicaid block grant you know, would be an end to entitlement. So that's a really big deal to all of us in this room. That means you can't rely on Olmstead anymore. The basis for it is gone. That means you can't rely on EPSDT guaranteeing that all medically necessary services are available to kids anymore. So, you know, and you can't rely on not having routine waiting lists for coverage, and et cetera, et cetera. So, so block grant clearly uh, opens up a question of which of any of 50 years of Medicaid you know, written law or case law still exists. If you take away the entitlement, <coughs> all of that is thrown into question. So that's hugely disruptive. Now, obviously, if those of you who haven't heard of it, the idea of a per capita cap for Medicaid would be Congress doing what the Texas <laughs> legislature has done for the last 15 years. So basically saying, okay, we'll let you have your enrollment growth, but we're going to not allow your cost per person to go up any more than X amount every year. And then the huge issue becomes how adequate is that? And how diligent is Congress about actually making sure that that amount actually reflects what the states need? We could spend, a, you know, we could and we will spend much more time talking about that kind of topic going forward. But with that in the background, that, you know, that makes you wonder, will the legislature, will the leadership feel like they should take some sort of action before the end of the section, session to uh, indicate what their choice will be if they're offered up that choice? So that's something we just have to keep our eyes out for. But it's also something that everybody in this room has to start trying to educate the decision makers about, about why you're concerned about these things. Because uh, it's, not, it's not somebody else's job. It's all of our job. And it's certainly not going to be adequately addressed if I'm the only one <laughs> talking about it. So seriously, it's like we're all going to have to start trying to figure out, from my perspective, from the work I do, what you know, what are the six things that I'm really worried about in this discussion? How do the people I care about potentially get affected? So we'll be talking a lot more about that. Just to take off a few other things that fall into the bucket of what could happen to a full repeal of the Affordable Care Act and and then the joint at the hip discussion of uh, proposals to either the library or per capita cap Medicaid at the federal level. Um, some of the some of the things to, to be aware of is that if you literally had a full repeal of the ACA, community first choice is gone. That's part of the ACA. So that thing that we liked so much no longer exists. Uh, Medicaid extension to uh, former foster youth until they hit their 26th birthday, that's gone. Um, the pre-existing condition. Yeah. Well, the, yeah. yeah, we'll get back to this. So, right, and I'm just talking Medicaid right now. <laughs> the the mega match that we get for chip now, which is about 93 cents on the dollar federal, that's gone. So it jumped up from like 73 cents on the dollar to 93 cents on the dollar. We're hardly paying anything for a chip program anymore. That's gone. And as I mentioned before, mental health parity, mental health substance use disorder parity for the individual marketplace, so that's anybody in Obamacare or anybody buying directly online from Blue Cross or Aetna or whoever, that marketplace is no longer <laughs> subject to parity, uh, nor would small group. So, you know, this is why we just urge everybody, you really gotta get past the talking points about, well, we're gonna let kids stay on their parents' plan until they're 26, and we're gonna do something about pre-existing conditions, but we're not gonna say what that is. You know, that's not enough. We're gonna to have to get a lot further than that. The, the ACA had a lot of other stuff in it. it you know, it, it phased out the donut hole and the Medicare prescription drug benefit. I mean, so there's a whole long list of things like that that we have to answer and that we have to say, this is why you have folks like the American Academy of Actuaries and the American Enterprise Institute in the last couple of weeks coming out saying, 
no repeal without replace. If you, you can't repeal and delay. If you just leave a big hole of uncertainty there, markets will collapse. Uh, people will lose coverage. It's going to be a big deal. So I'm going on too long, long about that. Um, but, but there are other issues for Texas that can come up in this uh, that are you know, not necessarily uh, the top priority for an advocate for low income Texans or for Texans with disabilities. Uh, or at least they're not, you know, not at the forefront of our minds, but they will affect us, so we need to be aware of them. And one is, if we do go into some kind of radical change in the financing of Medicaid, even if it's not a blind grant, it's a per capita cap, we're going to have to really think about um, whether our leadership is going to, out of, out of some kind of ideological position, and not fight for the highest possible amount of money for Texas. So, for example, if you were a governor or legislator from one of the 31 states that has expanded Medicaid and you're literally getting billions of dollars to pay for coverage for those people, you're probably not very excited about giving that money up and cutting all those people off. So then a big question comes, do I get to keep, does that money roll forward into the block grant or the capital cap formula? And so for Texas, uh, for the 19 states that have expanded Medicaid, of which we're one, there, sh there should be a question uh, if, if our folks are doing their job of, you know, if those states are holding on their money, do we get our six to eight billion dollars a year that the various different experts, including HHSC, have estimated? is what's sitting on the table if we did that coverage thing. So there's an issue about that. There's also an issue about the money that's in our 1115 waiver. So uh, there's no, we have at least one of the major proposals in Washington said, says there will be no more use of intergovernmental transfer money. Um, intergovernmental transfer money, money from local county governments, mostly the bigger ones, pays for, you know, virtually all of the waiver uh, and for the disproportionate share hospital program, which gives them additional sort of makeup money. Um, and as I mentioned before, we've got a couple of different sources, HHSC and the HMA report have both confirmed that literally 50% of Texas hospital reimbursements rely on supplemental payments. So if they cut off the doorways to supplemental payments, suddenly our hospitals have lost half of their Medicaid revenues and we probably can't manage that. So, so there's a lot of things to be concerned about in those formula fights. Um, and maybe we don't, everybody in this room doesn't have to be an expert on them, but we need to be keeping our ears open and understand they do affect what happens to us too. Um, I'm trying to think, there's just so many other things that I care about. You know, massive Medicaid managed care regulations that were promulgated last summer. Uh, you know, which, which regulations will still exist in a world where, uh, where A, I don't know if the, if the, I think Colleen alluded to this too, I don't know if the uh, new administration will be enforcing them, uh, like Perry, and then uh, will some of those things simply get stripped off because they no longer make sense under a revised Medicaid financing situation. So, uh, and I think one of the things, one of the most compelling things for all of us to understand about these proposals to completely restructure how Medicaid is paid for at the federal level is, is just, you know, is it just a cost shift? Is it literally just Congress doing essentially, uh, you know, what Texas has done in terms of telling Medicaid they can't ask for an actual cost growth? And, and is it, does all of that just result in a cost shift to local governments ultimately? Because you know, if Congress is saying I want cost certainty on Medicaid, uh, despite the fact that they've never had it for Medicare, you know, or any of the, those healthcare programs, uh, is that just sending stuff downhill? And do, is does it lock Texas into things we don't want to be locked into? Do we locked into our low payment provider payments? So I, I, I kind of wish I hadn't had to even talk about that federal stuff, but I think that's going to be one of our big challenges. Is trying to connect the dots for people, and uh, we really look forward to seeing how I can work with everybody in this room uh, to connect those dots. Thanks. We get something, you know, but in terms of the Medicaid waiver waiting list, which is over 80,000 adults with disabilities, or in terms of the state plan programs or so, or are not on it, that's at least another 150,000, we get nothing. And I think if everyone here was given the choice of 
not going to the dentist, they would still go because every one of us knows what that means for our, our health, our well-being, our appearance, our ability to work, frankly. And frankly, I'm, I, I had the privilege of spending a lot of time with adults with disabilities around the state, and it's undeniable that the condition of their teeth, their oral health, is obvious very quickly. So uh, I've joined up with the Texas Oral Health Coalition, and what I've found is a lot of people want to propose, and I'm calling these magic dust solutions. So I'm not a, not a prompt here. So there's actually my colleague on this. So what is a magic dust solution? Oh, the faith community. I'll sprinkle some magic dust on uh, so you can see the faith community will provide the service. Well, they, they might do that for a few, a handful of people a year. And this foundation, the St. David's Foundation, has a tremendous dental program that amounts to just a drop in the budget. So that's, that's just a little bit of magic. On uh, Susie, with her, with her help, when I approached my personal dentist and asked him to take on a, um, a, um, a pro bono client, and he did, and he has two. Okay, so do you realize that if you take every dentist in the United States, every dentist in the United States, and each of them took two pro bono clients, that would fall short of what the demand is for adults with disabilities in Texas, okay? So in other words, throw magic dust. The magic dust is helping Susie, but it's really helping people. There is one solution that's been, pro been proposed by HHSC, and that's to open up the dental clinics in the state-supported living centers so that adults with disabilities who live in the community can access that. But let me tell you, that's, that's about as false a promise. That's, that's not even magic dust. That's false magic dust. The reason why there's only 13 of those in the entire state we already have a caseload of 3,000 individuals with complex needs. Most of the adults and disabilities don't qualify to receive any services, dental services. You know, remember only the few on Medicaid of dental care to adults with disabilities. And you know what? I can almost guarantee you the benefits will outweigh the cost. That's one of those things that if you figure out the cost of doing nothing is more than the cost of doing the right thing. Now, Susie is going to work with me, and you know, what did I say? Something about why you're interested in this? Well, no. Exactly what his last point um, the more we go with how do you get the more clutch it to fix what was wrong when we could be preventing it in the first place. And when I came to dinner in 2010, I had a life that carried in and stuff, and I couldn't get them taken care of because I needed to be put under so someone can do it, but many kids don't think for that. So, um, when I finally got the house, I lost a few months, and I really regret that. But the next <coughs> I could do that, um, so if I can help others not get into yeah, thanks, Susie. I, could, I mean, do we really want people getting to the point where they're having their teeth extracted and call that dental services? That's what we do for adults with disabilities primarily in Texas. Emergency room dental care. So study them, you know, those are supposed to be a little easier, but every one of us in this room knows there's no such thing as an easy bill. 
All right, so I'm here really applauding for Susie. <laughs> okay, so Lowen, Greg, and Cam. Okay, Cam is with the American Cancer Society. Greg is with NAMI, Texas. And Simone is with the um, National MS Society. So Tim Santos, you guys will come up next. I'll give you a heads up. So, yeah, there's one first. Okay. However you want to do it. be part of what Cam and Greg are going to be addressing as well. Um, so the National MS Society is working um, with consumer and patient groups across the state to introduce legislation that would um, increase consumer protections for step therapy requirements. So for those of you who are um, um, not familiar with the term step therapy, it's also referred to as fail first. So when your insurance company requires you to try a different drug than your healthcare provider um, prescribes and fail on that before covering your physician's first choice. Um, so really briefly, currently the only protections regarding step therapy and for um, uh, into, for the private market is um, was passed in 2011 HB 1405 and that included a prohibition against adding step therapy requirements mid-year. Um, so we are working to sort of build on that. So the bill that we are hoping to introduce shortly would require step therapy <coughs> protocols to be based on um, medical guidelines rather than cost. It would prevent patients from having to try and fail companies to add uh, step therapy protocols at renewal. It would identify situations that would exempt a patient from being required to try and fail on a drug. Um, and those would be, it would the um, step therapy drug would cause a significant barrier to the uh, patient's adherence or compliance to uh, the plan of care, worsen a comorbid, um, condition decrease the individual's ability to achieve or maintain reasonable function. Uh, it would likely cause an adverse reaction. Uh, be expected to be, uh, excuse me, it would be expected to be ineffective based on the known clinical characteristics of the patient or the patient has tried a prescription drug in the same pharmacological class as the step therapy drug um, and that was not effective. Um, so those are the sort of list of uh, exceptions that would allow a patient to opt out of the step therapy um, drug and um, in addition this bill would allow um, the patient if to access an expedited appeal so currently if someone is appealing a step therapy requirement for a new prescription drug the uh, internal and external review can take up to 53 calendar days this drug would allow them to ex to um, access an appeal and get an answer in three days. And so that's a big improvement. Um, Representative Greg Bonin will be filing this bill in the House and Senator Hancock will be filing in the Senate. Um, the bill is getting some final tweaks in Ledge Council right now and we hope to have it shortly. Um, we had a little bit of a printer issue and so I don't have enough of the um, issue papers or draft language for everybody, and I apologize about that, but I do have some sign-up sheets, and so if, uh, maybe if you're interested in joining this coalition and would like to get updates, um, I can pass out or we can put the... Um, email, email it to us and we'll oh, distribute electronically. Perfect, okay. that's even better. Yeah. Um, so I said that I would be really, really brief so that um, Greg and Cam could um, continue, but um, I'll be around if anybody has any questions or wants to get involved. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Greg Hanch. Uh, I work as public policy director for the Texas affiliate of the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI Texas. 
and our purpose is to help improve the quality of life for people affected by mental illness. And we do that through education, support, and advocacy. The issue that I'd like to speak with you about today is what we refer to as non-medical switching. And this is sort of a catch-all term for people losing access to their medications due to a decision that is made by their insurance company based on non -medical. So it could come in the form of the insurance company requiring the person to complete a step therapy protocol, like Simone was talking about. Also, it could be the drug simply being removed from the formulary. Um, it could be that the drug is moved to a higher cost-sharing tier or the cost-sharing requirements are increased. Um, there is currently limited protection against non-medical switching in Texas statute. Uh, specifically, Texas statute prohibits switches uh, in, in the middle of a plan year. So, uh, you know, in, in July, there are, uh, there are limitations on those non-medical switches that can be made. Um, and there are certain circumstances that, that require a person to be notified uh, if, if a switch is being made. But there's not uh, a, a lot of clarity in the statute um, about whether that protection applies to the notifications or whether it broadly prohibits switches from being made in the middle of a plan year. Um, so we're, one of the things that we're looking to do is closing that, uh, that loophole or that lack of clarity um, around what that the statute around modification of drug coverage applies to. Um, and then also we want to ensure that people don't lose access to their medication from plan year to plan year. So a person stays in the same health plan from year to year, they often assume that the same medications are going to be available to them. Um, but the health plan will often make a change to the formulary uh, in the middle, you know, during the renewal period, and that results in the person losing access to their medication. Um, and just, you know, thinking about the experience of people with a lot of chronic health conditions, including certain mental illnesses, who uh, take years, it, it can take them years to find the right medication that works for them. And, uh, you know, oftentimes they have to try one medication after another, and they fail, and they fail, and they finally find the compound that works for them. Um, we should, it, it, there's too much risk associated with switching the, the person off of that medication that works for them based on, for, for a non-medical reason. Um, so we should be erring on the side of keeping people on, with, with chronic health conditions on medications that they're stable on. Um, and through our NAMI's grassroots advocacy training program, we have a program called NAMI Smarts. And one of the, the modules in that program is, is around medication access. And through implementing that program, which is only about a year or two old, um, we've heard a lot of stories of people uh, around the country who, who have had issues with medication access. And we surveyed our membership here in Texas and found that this is a, a significant issue that has caused uh, you know, serious health consequences. At times, it has caused loss of life. Um, and there are about six or so states that uh, had legislat legislative proposals on this in uh, 2016, and Texas is one of about 10 states that uh, is looking at this issue for 2017, and we have a, a great coalition that we put together um, to, to uh, advance a legislative proposal. Our, our language is currently in legislative <laughs> council. Um, we don't have a firm commitment from a legislative office on, uh, on who, who will file it, but we do know that we'll have language. We, we uh, are fairly certain that we do have an office, at least in the House, who, who will file this bill. Um, and so we're, you know, we're looking for as many partners as we can get on this issue. We need all hands on deck. Um, we have a lot of providers, a lot of different patient advocacy groups who have expressed interest and will uh, be continuing to, to, to push that conversation at the legislature and with our partners. Um, so please reach out to me if this is something that, that your organization is interested in working on. I'm Cam Scott with the American Cancer Society Cancer Action Network. I serve as Senior Director for Texas Government Relations. And uh, in the access to care area, one of the big issues we're concerned about is step therapy as well. And, um, an interesting environmental piece in terms of what's happening at the Capitol this session is 
the heat being generated around this Medicaid formulary issue. And those of you who are at the Capitol are familiar with this, but um, when Medicaid was essentially moved to managed care companies to, to manage, the pharmacy benefit was carved out to remain under state control with a single state formulary. And previous sessions have kind of kicked that can down the road by saying we're gonna sun we're gonna extend the sunset date on on that Medicaid formulary and keep it as it is with one single formulary. Well, that sunset date is approaching, it'll be next year, and so this is the session where something has to be determined. And it's kind of setting up a battle between um, different parties, including uh, pharmaceutical companies and the insurers. Uh, of course, the insurers would like it to all move over into their control, and um, pharmaceutical companies would prefer for it to stay in a, in a single formulary. And all of the patient advocacy organizations are taking a look at this, trying to figure out, well, what, what benefits patients the most? Um, and we are trying to look at that from all perspectives. Um, the biggest concern, I think, for all of us is that under the current scenario, there are a number of patient protections in place that would go away unless there's something proactive on our part to ensure that those patient protections are in place. So what I have for you this morning is a call to action for those of us who are concerned about this to work together to understand this issue, to make sure that whatever happens in this debate, the patient protections remain in place whether it's moved to managed care or if it stays where it is. And if it stays where it is, there are a number of issues and problems that patients and providers face as well that could be addressed in this, this situation where there can be a close microscope on that. So I uh, certainly would invite interested organizations to, to join us in that, that conversation to figure out how to, how to uh, protect patients in that process. Thank you. Thank you. Our concern is strictly on the intended beneficiaries, not who gets to do the administrative work. So I'm uh, very delighted to uh, welcome Frank Santos and Fernando Santos to speak on this next subject. I've known Frank for a long time, he's been a big supporter, and uh, I'll let you guys handle this one. <laughs> Yes, you must. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Dennis. And thank you all, all for being here to, to listen to these, uh, to these issues. It's really important. Um, I am Frank Santos, and I am really proud that I could uh, have one of my sons join me today, Fernando Santos, who's sitting right over here in the corner. Um, we are here representing um, a foundation we formed called the No Melanoma Foundation. Uh, short is uh, NOMA Foundation is how we um, is how we have it on our Facebook page, and, and that and, and that organization was formed um, in honor of my wife who passed away about a year ago from uh, <coughs> metastatic melanoma, and uh, this is the first time we've actually talked about these issues, but they're really really important. So um, I wanted to kind of give you some background on why we formed the organization, which is primarily uh, for education and resources for people that um, are diagnosed with metastatic melanoma. I don't think there's a lot of information out there. Um, you kind of recreate the wheel when that happens, and I felt like, uh, you know, maybe we can help with that. What brought us to today um, is, uh, is really more on the legislative side of things. Um, and really important legislation that we wanted to talk to you about and see if you'd be interested um, in some way being a part of it. Uh, when my wife was diagnosed uh, back uh, in November of 2015, um, uh, we, like everybody else uh, who goes through that process, uh, your, your response is, we're gonna beat this, we're gonna do everything we can do. Uh, get the best doctors, um, get the best medications, and we're just going to fight our way through it. And that's what we did. We, we did exactly those things. Uh, what happened to us, which uh, was, was something that was uh, kind of unusual, and uh, maybe it's not that unusual, but we'll find out this session, is um, during, uh, 
during the early part of uh, her disease, um, it, it, it was inside, it got into her bone marrow and her liver and really caused a lot of problems. It put her in the hospital early on. And the only real medication out there is the newest immunotherapy that uh, had just been approved, literally, um, probably weeks before she got, um, she got diagnosed. And um, we can thank, uh, you know, and, you know, people like Bruce from our squid. That's the drug we were looking at. That's the drug that was our miracle drug that um, uh, we were going to uh, utilize to, uh, to help her through this process. And, um, but being that, it, that, the, that the, the cancer had invaded her, her bone marrow, um, her T cells had dropped to it's so low. And the only way that the immunotherapy works is if your T cells are. At, at the right level. That's the whole point of the immunotherapy. So she went into the hospital, she got the treatment she needed, she got her T-cell count up high enough, and, um, and as our oncologist was telling us, she tells us every day as we're sitting there at her bedside, he'd say, you know, as soon as we're done, you know, we got the level, we gotta give her medication immediately. We gotta start it the next day. Well, uh, that was about, a week and a half into um, into into her illness, and uh, that next day she got denied that medication. Um, now uh, we have insurance; uh, it was covered. The doctor prescribed it. There is no other drug available. Uh, yet she was denied that medication. She was actually denied two of them. Um, she was denied, but the, the main one was she was denied her immunotherapy. Uh, they went through three appeals uh, to try and get the, the medication, and time was lapsing. And when you have a metastatic cancer, you don't have you don't have time. And uh, so we started a social media campaign, uh, really just out of desperation, and it went viral. Um, I have a sister-in-law lives in South Africa. And she sent it to all of her expats and, and across the across the country, and it went uh, in every direction you could possibly imagine. Uh, it doesn't matter what you uh, you know. I'm not here to give, give any political speech, but I actually got an email back. We, somehow it ended up on Donald Trump's uh, uh, Twitter feed, and he responded to how unfair this was. And uh, and so we have that tweet, which was which was crazy because this was back you know 2015. Um, but it finally got back to the CEO of uh, the company, and I, I'm not going to call out the company because I, I think it's, a, it's really more about the issue. Um, and that CEO called our doctor and said, okay, I want to make this right. Well, that's great, but uh, two weeks into this process, and her T-cell count had dropped back down to the level where she really, the immunotherapy was going to have um, a minimal uh, impact. Matter of fact, sometimes it's even worse um, if you take it. What are you going to do? You're not going to say no. You're going to try it. <coughs> so uh, we did, and we kept trying to get her T cell count up. She only lived for eight weeks, and so two weeks out of eight weeks is a lifetime. And whether or not it would have made a difference, um, we don't know. We'll never know. But we do know that. Uh, President Jimmy Carter had the same uh, diagnosis and it was in his brain and he did receive hit the medication when he was prescribed it and he's he survived it and he is cancer-free today same diagnosis metastatic melanoma so uh, two sessions ago which is this, the irony of some of this is two sessions ago I worked on a piece of legislation and I'll give you the number, um, HB uh, 965, no, I'm sorry, excuse me, HB 2541, carried by Dr. Zerwas and Lois Colthorst in the Senate. And that piece of legislation, I was actually carrying for a client of mine. And for those who don't know me, I'm also a lobbyist and I have a lobby firm. And so I find myself in a very odd position being on this side as an advocate but um, I'll probably be one of the strongest advocates you're ever going to see at the Capitol this session. Um, that bill said that if you had insurance and you were covered and it was prescribed by your physician, that you could not be denied that medication. And the bill passed unanimously through the House and it was killed by the plans on the Senate side. I had no idea we'd be living that exact 
scenario, you know, less than a year later. So that bill's coming back up. Uh, we're filing that again, um, and it's being drafted right now. Um, I don't want to. I don't want to say too much about who's going to carry it and all that until we have the bill, and I want to send that and have it to Dennis and have that out to you. Um, but that's an important bill, I think, for anybody who is diagnosed with, um, you know, a metastatic cancer. Um, and in this case, the language says if you've get, been given a terminal diagnosis of less than two years, so it doesn't actually speak to <coughs> necessarily metastatic cancer, but a diagnosis of less than two years is generally stage four, a stage four cancer. Um, it could be other diseases as well. Um, really important piece. The other piece that we're working on is a bill that was passed um, specifically for metastatic cancer diagnosis in Georgia. And that bill is HB 965. It's not, not Texas uh, HB 965, but, but the Georgia bill HB 965, and it's called the Jimmy Carter Cancer Treatment Access Act. And that bill, it speaks to step therapy. It's, it's similar uh, to what we're talking about, but in this case, if you've been diagnosed with metastatic cancer, um, they uh, essentially are not allowed to make someone go through step therapy before, you know, fail on a drug before they get the drug that they need. And, and, and really, the, the, the common denominator here is you don't have time. You don't have time when you're in that situation. We lived it. Uh, we were there at the, at, the, at the hospital. We saw a lot of people in similar situations. We're not alone. Um, we know there's a lot of people that have gone through the same situation. And the one thing you don't have is you don't have time. And you also don't have time to be, you know, going through appeals processes with, with your insurance company while you're trying to deal with, you know, something that is, is the most horrible thing that could happen to you in your life. Um, and that's, that's an important piece, I think, that, that's missing. I don't know, the, the, the con, you know where the, the connection happens and, or, or doesn't happen when someone actually denies it at what level, but we found the guy who actually denied the medication. I feel sorry for him. I hope he's, <laughs> I hope he's okay because we put his information out there on, on all our Twitter feeds and Facebook and everything, and the poor guy, I don't even know if he's still working for the company, but um, uh, he was hammered about it, and um, like I said, it went viral. So uh, my sons and I, um, it's just the three of us right now. Um, my uh, Fernando is a seventh grader over at Hill Country Middle School, and I have a senior at Westlake High School who's on, doing a senior project today and couldn't, couldn't make it. Um, we're going to be going around, we're going to be talking to every member, and we're going to be testifying, and these two bills are, are two, uh, two very important pieces of legislation we would love to have anybody who's interested uh, come and join and, uh, and help us with. And um, I just want to thank you for being here and listening to us. These are, all these issues are critical. Um, thank you guys for putting this, this on and, and having us here today. Thank you. Thanks, Frank. Thank you, Fernando, for making it too. I, I would just say that you know, hearing Susie speak before, and then Frank, and then Fernando here, you know, the human, the human face of the issue. You know, they see a lot of me, but to see guys like you know, Bob, Kathy, David, Mac, Renee, Susie, all of you, Frank, Fernando, and now Chase, it has a power that I, I can't put my finger on what it is. But you're, as a long time longest friend, you know that that's absolute truth. Okay, we're, it looks like we're going to be right on time to close around noon, and then that will be the start of an informal networking time to talk to anyone you want. Um, the Immunization Partnership came in from Houston, Reagan, Washington. I guess you get to start. I get to start. <laughs> uh -huh. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank
thank you so much for the opportunity to be here uh, this morning to talk about some important issues we're going to be advocating for this coming session. I do have a few slides um, just because I'm visual and um, I imagine you are visual as well. But as we're trying to pull it out, um, I'll give you a little bit of a brief, brief background. Here. This is what you bring up. Um, can I tell you, so I'm the Director of Advocacy and Policy for the Immunization Partnership. And for those of you who are not familiar with our organization, um, we are a nonprofit organization dedicated to um, eradicating vaccine preventable diseases. And we do this through a couple of different ways, uh, through education and through advocacy. And we work with um, a number of different stakeholders and partners. and. Uh, immunization coalitions all across the state to um, improve the immunization landscape and ultimately to improve uh, immunization rates to make sure that our uh, communities are safe and healthy and free from vaccine preventable diseases. Um, it's really interesting because we're currently in a time where we're starting to see um, some diseases that we have not seen um, uh, in, a, in quite some time reemerge. Um, I'm not sure if all of you are familiar, but we're actually, um, Texas is undergoing a mumps outbreak currently um, in the North Texas area. Um, a few years back, um, again in North Texas, for some reason, uh, North Texas tends to be a hotbed, um, we had a measles outbreak um, in, a faith, um, in a faith community. So we're really, really kind of concerned and alarmed to see um, these trends that are happening in our state because we have um, communities out there that are medically fragile and vulnerable, and it's our job and responsibility as a community to help protect them and keep them safe from these different types of diseases. Let me skip over that one. So um, kind of the trend that is happening in Texas is we're starting to see more and more families across the state um, make a decision not to vaccinate their children and um, send them to a public school. And one of the reasons why we're very, very alarmed with this is because um, there's a lot of research and data to support that these non-medical exemptions, basically exemptions of immunizations based on um, reasons of conscience or beliefs, tend to cluster, and they cluster geographically in schools and in neighborhoods and communities. And it not only puts um, children who are medically fragile at risk, but also think about adults. Adults who are um, either volunteering in the school system, they are teachers, um, or they happen to live um, close by to a school. All of these individuals are, are put at risk. So one of the pillars and hallmarks that we're focusing on this session is how do we curb the number of not the, this rise in non-medical exemptions? And I do have copies of our publication. Um, every other year we put out a, a publication. We poll stakeholders and talk to stakeholders all across the state. Last year we talked to close to 2,000 stakeholders, either in person or through a survey, to determine um, what are some of the successes and challenges to keeping our communities um, uh, safe and, and risk-free from vaccine-preventable diseases. And those recommendations end up getting published in, um, in our publication. There are a number of different recommendations in the publication that span cradle to grave, but obviously we um, try to um, tackle um, a handful of issues that are kind of considered gateways to some of this reemergent of vaccine-preventable diseases. And non-medical exemptions tends to be one of them, um, because as we start to see more families opt out, then we, we're kind of priming ourselves for, um, for a potential outbreak. So we have a number of different priorities um, this session. Again, um, a couple of, uh, majority of them are how do we address this rise in non-medical exemptions. Um, the first and foremost, which is kind of our, our pillar priority, is um, around information transparency. And this was actually a piece of legislation we proposed last session uh, to require um, school districts to make school campus immunization and exemption rate data available to the public. So currently only district level data is available, but that doesn't really tell the whole story because if you are a parent, for example, who is trying to make a decision as to where they're going to send their child, especially a child who may potentially be undergoing chemotherapy, they need that information and that data to make an informed choice. Uh, we were successful in getting it out of the House last session. Um, unfortunately, it did die in the Senate. It did not come up for a hearing. 
Um, so again, we are going to be bringing this back up. Um, we're tweaking a few things right now, um, but we will have it um, ready to go within the next couple of weeks. Additionally, um, around non-medical exemptions, um, we are um, looking to um, do a, we have a cleanup bill, um, which just basically clarifies the definition of non-medical exemptions. Currently, the way it's written in statute is um, if you choose to uh, not vaccinate based on reasons of conscience or conscientious objections, um, we're kind of changing that and kind of making it a more broad category, which is a non-medical exemption. Um, additionally, um, education is so key and important. Um, we want to ensure that if parents indeed choose, make that decision to not vaccinate their children, they've got the um, accurate and scientific information available uh, in order to uh, make sure that they they have an educate they make an educated decision on not vaccinating their children. So um, House Bill 126 will require an education course. <coughs> In, a dis in addition to the current affidavit process in order for a parent to uh, seek a non-medical exemption. Um, we're also looking at a couple of cancer prevention bills um, specifically related to um, HPV vaccination. We have a vaccine to help prevent cancer in both um, boys and girls. Um, and cancer is on the rise. We know Texas has some of the highest um, cancer rates across the country. What's really interesting is um, we're starting to see more and more head and neck cancers in men on the rise. In fact, um, head and neck cancers are increasing 5% every year in um, men over 50. So um, a couple of bills to um, expand the access to uh, cancer prevention vaccines to adolescents. And then also one is just a data report, a yearly um, HPV immunization report, um, so we can better understand what's happening at our county levels and we can deploy um, educational resources effectively. And I will point out that um, all of these bills are actually being carried by um, Representative Sarah Davis out of, out of Houston. And then lastly, uh, the immunization registry. Um, this is an issue that we have been um, advocating for for many, many years. Um, currently, we do have an immunization registry. Um, it is a cradle-to-grave registry. Um, however, it is an opt-in registry, which makes the registry very efficient. And so we're advocating for uh, the registry to change from an um, opt-in system to an opt-out system. And so... Um, I would just ask that we would um, appreciate any and all support from um, each and every one of you. Immunizations, it's a community issue, it's not only an individual issue. And if we continue to see the trends that we're seeing in the state, um, while we have a mumps outbreak going on right now, um, what, we, what we really, really fear is a significant widespread measles outbreak, similar to what California uh, experienced a couple of years ago, and um, we're really trying to um, avoid that kind of situation. This issue is played out in social media. Um, there's a lot of discussion um, that, that takes place, and so we, I just ask that you know if you are active on social media, especially on Facebook, is to go to um, facebook.com Immunize USA. That is the Immunization Partnerships Facebook page. Um, updates, call to action, alerts will be posted um, through that media. Additionally, we have a grassroots supporter network. This is where we have people come help and walk the halls and talk about the issues. And that group is called Immunize Texas. They too have a Facebook page, so please, um, please go and visit that page. And then lastly, um, if you do go to our website, which is immunizeusa.org, you can sign up to be on our mailing list to receive <coughs> alerts um, and kind of updates in terms of what's happening with um, the pieces of legislation we're advocating for in this session. Thank you. I can zoom through it quickly. <laughs> All right, next up is Mac Marsh, accessible parking. and to CTD and uh, all of the other folks that uh, have invited us and partnered with us over the last several years. Uh, I'm Mac Marsh, I'm the uh, Executive Director for Access Empowerment and the Project Director for a program called Parking Mobility. 
Access empowerment is at our heart uh, a data driven nonprofit organization that uses data to increase access to our community uh, and specifically for people with disabilities. Seven years ago, we launched our parking mobility program, which is a, a program that increases uh, awareness, enforcement, and education around accessible parking. Uh, one of the things that we recognized way back then was the lack of data. Um, and so we started looking at how can we collect that data. Uh, we now are five years into really good data collection in Hayes County and in Travis County. Uh, and are wanting to use the data and the trends that we've seen in those counties uh, to really start to address some of the, the weaknesses in the state legislation. Uh, Texas Transportation Code 681 is the law that deals specifically with accessible parking uh, and it's really important because that's the law that really provides access to all of these other things we talk about. Healthcare, employment, housing, uh, other transportation options. And so uh, with parking mobility, what we're doing is uh, really advocating uh, for some changes to that law that will allow for local governments to address this issue uh, more effectively. One of the things that we found uh, here in Travis County specifically was that there was an 80% dismissal rate of citations that were written for uh, people who parked illegally in accessible parking spaces. But digging even further into that, 90% of, of those people were repeat offenders. So they were getting tickets over and over and over again and then getting them thrown out. Uh, and so we want to change that. And the way that we change that is through our education. We have a uh, offender education program now in Travis County uh, that's been up and running now for three years. Uh, in that program, a person who receives a citation for parking, <coughs> excuse me, illegally in an accessible parking space has to take a class. Uh, so they either take it online or in person uh, and then their ticket can be dismissed. In three years of offering that in Travis County and five years of offering that offender education course in Hayes County, we have a 0% recidivism rate. So the key to solving this problem is education. But now we need to do that across the state. If we're gonna solve this problem in Travis County and in Hayes County, we have to solve this problem in Denton, Texas, and in Houston, and in every other community across the state. And what we're hearing from those local folks, uh, local decision makers, either their county officials or often law enforcement partners that we talk with, is that they don't understand the state law. Uh, so in Texas Transportation Code 681, it allows for citizen volunteer enforcement programs, but it's very vague. Uh, basically, it says that citizen volunteers have to have four hours of training. Doesn't say training on what. Um, so in our program, we train for four hours on how to tie your tennis shoes, and then we send you out to enforce law. Uh, you know, we're, we're asking, um, in particular, uh, for TEA to look at um, some of the programs that do exist across the state. There are some really good ones. Uh, there are some really bad ones. Uh, and we want to come up with some statewide standards for those trainings. Uh, we also want to give um, our judges, because enforcement isn't just writing a ticket. Enforcement is the entire process of adjudicating that citation. And so we want judges to understand that um, and give them options. So in Texas, we have the highest fine in the country uh, for parking illegally in an accessible parking space at $500 minimum. And so what, what we see is a lot of judges dismissing these cases because they think the fines are too high. They don't understand why those fines exist. And so they have the discretion to dismiss a case for any reason. And so often either the prosecutor or the judge themselves are dismissing these cases because they feel like the fines are too high. When we started talking with those prosecutors and started talking with those judges, what we heard was, we'd like to have some other option. Instead of just dismissing it, could we send them to a class? Could we educate them on what these issues are? And so that's what we started doing here in Travis County. Um, our dismissal rates still aren't where we'd like them to be in Travis County. We're at about 65% dismissal rate in Travis County. Uh, we're at a 8% dismissal rate in Hayes County. Hayes County has a little more commitment to, to this program. Uh, but again, we have a 0% uh, percent recidivism rate once someone's completed that course, and we're really proud of that uh, because it means that that's the missing piece. 
And so we want the legislature to provide some guidance to local uh, communities, in particular to the judges and prosecutors, to allow them to uh, uh, provide for that offender education across the, across the state, but make sure there's some standards to that. Um, one of the things we did was, if any, I know nobody here has ever gotten a speeding ticket, Renee. Um, <laughs> and, but when you get a speeding ticket in the state of Texas, you can take a safe driving course and you know, have that ticket reduced. Uh, and the incentive there is to keep it off of your insurance, so your insurance doesn't skyrocket. skyrocket. Um, but we want to provide kind of the same option. Um, but we looked at a lot of those courses, and there's a lot of really bad courses out there. Uh, they really don't teach people why speeding is bad or why reckless driving is bad. So we want to make sure that if we're going to move forward with an offender education, specifically around accessible parking, then we want to make sure that we do that in a real responsible manner, in a manner that will make a difference and will help to educate people. Uh, we have 16-point plan that we're looking at um, working the legislature with this year. Um, all of it has zero dollar ask. Um, it's really around just clarifying the law uh, and around helping to provide some guidance for local uh, decision makers and, and to provide better ways to, to address this issue. Uh, we want to increase enforcement, uh, so we want to have more communities that have citizen volunteers that are enforcing. Uh, we want to increase education, uh, so we want to make sure that offenders, uh, that that option is out there to start educating offenders across the state. Uh, but we also want to do some upfront education. Right now, when someone receives a, an accessible plate or a placard, there's nothing, uh, no information that they get that says, here are your rights and responsibilities. And so we want to uh, provide that. We want to start giving people upfront education that says, you know, when you have a placard, you can use those accessible spaces, but don't block those access aisles for people who use vans. Um, and that's one of the, the second largest violations that we see is those blocking violations. Um, we also want to start looking at ways to deal with placards. So right now in the state of Texas, uh, any individual uh, can get up to two placards. Uh, that's the hang tags that hang from your rearview mirror. Um, those, by their very definition, are portable. They go with the individual. They're not tied to the vehicle. Um, and so what happens with that second one? It ends up on the black market. Uh, we, we worked with Hayes County Sheriff's Department to do a sting at a, at a flea market and confiscated 300 uh, placards that were being sold. And that's happening in flea markets across the state. Um, so we need to get those placards off the streets. Um, we're, we also want to provide for uh, some processes, better processes, to make sure that when someone no longer needs a placard, either they've passed away or they no longer have a disability uh, or have, no longer have a need for that placard, uh, that that placard gets returned to the state. Right now they go into that junk drawer everybody's got in the kitchen and that ends up in the trash at some point and those end up on the street as well. Uh, we've even seen some instances where uh, grandparents were putting them in the gift baskets to students that were going off to college. Uh, they were putting their second placard into those gift baskets and saying, uh, yeah. So we want to we want to get we want to do away with that second placard. We do understand that there are some some very specific instances where two placards may be useful um, or may be necessary, and in those cases we do want to provide some exemptions. Uh, but we want to get people involved in that in those discussions uh, in the last session uh, and in the session before uh, there's been a push to provide for van only parking so right now accessible parking spaces are all the same there are some that are designated as van accessible but they're not van only uh, we think you're, that that's premature to, to start changing the rules if you're not enforcing your current rules don't start changing rules because it's just going to confuse everybody um, and actually what we're seeing in Hayes County and Travis County, because of the education and awareness that we're raising, um, we're not seeing as many people using those van accessible spaces when they don't need them. Um, so we, we are pushing or are asking for a two-year data-driven study uh, using the data from our program and other programs across the state uh, to look at van accessible parking to see if there's a need for a change. Uh, or if education and awareness alone uh, could help to alleviate that problem. Um, make sure there's not anything else big that I'm missing. One of the things that we have, have been kind of tracking and looking at, uh, but we're 
probably a session or two away from, from actually being to the point where we can get legislators to wrap their minds around this, but there's no uh, statewide database on placards. So right now when you get a placard, if you apply for your placard in Harris County um, and then you move to Travis County, you get to keep that placard until it expires and that's often seven years away. Um, and there's no way for a Travis County officer or an Austin uh, police officer to be able to verify the validity of that placard because they don't have access to Harris County's databases. And so we, what we want to do is push for a statewide database on placards as well as a date, statewide data play, database on who is um, prescribing placards. So we're seeing a lot of issues, not really in Central Texas, but down in the Houston area in particular, uh, we've identified uh, a problem with dock shopping. So people will go from doctor to doctor to doctor and ask for the placard form to be filled out. And then they take those into uh, the surrounding counties uh, and get, they get placards and then they sell those. And so we want to we want to start looking at okay what doctors are prescribing them, start to educate physicians in particular around um, how to prescribe those appropriately. Uh, but we have a 16 point uh, legislative action plan that we'll be walking the halls with. We really encourage everybody to get involved with this issue, um, and we'd be more than happy to have you on our team. We make it really simple to get involved. We do most of our work through social media and, and online as well, uh, but we certainly want to have as many partners as possible in, in the halls as well. If you are a Hayes County, Travis County, or Williamson County resident, we encourage you to get involved with our local efforts uh, through volunteerism. It's really simple. You down, download the Parking Mobility app and just go to your app store and look for Parking Mobility. Download the app and that gets you involved. Uh, you can do everything from be, just be a casual user to help us to report violations when you see them and that helps us to understand data. Or you can actually become a trained volunteer and your reports can result in a citation being issued but more importantly, that individual having to take the course. Uh, we are doing a lot of advocacy on the local level. Our push over <coughs> the rest of January and into February is to get Williamson County on board with this program uh, so that we have a continuity of, of enforcement and education across Central Texas, and then we hope to grow up and down I-35 and then out from there. So uh, get involved. You can find us on Facebook at Parking Mobility. Uh, or you can certainly contact us at www.parkingmobility.com. Thank you, sir. Thanks. Principal uh, advocacy organization. We're kind of parking for a climb in the last seven sessions. It seems like every session we go and we tweak this, we tweak that. But I've really become convinced that some of the stuff that Mac was talking about is the ultimate way to <coughs> finally solve this. And you know, it's not really about parking, it's about access to get from the vehicle you are driving or are in to where you want to go. Will Francis, who's the chair of the steering committee of the Texas Forward Coalition, which is the revenue, revenue coalition of, well, I don't know, 65 or 70 groups or something like that. You're next. We should move this. That way. Okay. That way? Yeah. Okay. Good morning. My name is Will Francis, and I am the Government Relations Director for the National Association of Social Workers. Um, and I'm very honored to be the chair of the steering committee uh, for Texas Forward. Um, we focus on the budget and a balanced budget, a comprehensive budget. Uh, full disclosure, I became a social worker because I heard there was no math involved. And so when I was stepping into this position, I asked Dan Perel, my predecessor, if there would be any math, and he lied to me, and here I am. <laughs> um, what we really do, our whole goal is to talk about the things that underpin everything you all do, which is talking about what the budget is. And as we were back there listening to, to some really great presenters. I actually got an email about um, what our budget um, is going to look like for next session, and it looks like it's going to be about $104.87 billion for general revenue, which, just to put in context, is about a little about almost $10 million less than it was last session, which was $113 billion. And this is why everyone sort of hears that 
hey, we're not going to have money this session. And one of the things we at Texas Ford have been trying to do is say, no, there is money out there. It's just money that you all are choosing not to spend. And so really, I mean, I think, and one of the things that I got back from one of the members um, in Texas Ford, and, and I'll talk a little bit about it, but just sort of put, just to talk a little bit more about this specific budget, is this current budget estimate will put us at about $4 billion in the amount of GR that was spent last session. So essentially, we've got a gap there that will look like, it'll, it'll look like cuts. And what we're coming back is saying is you're, you're telling us we have to cinch our belts. You're telling us we don't have money. We're saying there's money in the rainy day fund, which is look at about, which by 2019 will have almost uh, $12 billion in there, about $1.9 billion. It can't go below $7.5 million, so there, there are dollars out there. You all are choosing not to spend this, and that's really the thing that, that sort of is the basis of Texas Forward is we want a smart budget, we want a balanced budget, but we also want dollars for services. We believe education should be funded, we believe human services should be funded, we believe special needs should be funded. Um, uh, I'm bad. Yeah. And, and so again, this is really what we're about. We've got, as Anna said, we've got about 65, 70 member organizations. Um, last session we talked about ensuring that education, health, human services, and other vital services are funded at the levels to meet today's needs and prepares Texans for growth and prosperity. Again, we believe in using available cash balances, using the rainy day fund, leveraging and use of federal funding, which is, which is so important. Um, we talk about the equity and adequacy of Texas revenue streams. One of the things I think that really frustrates us is that so much of Texas, uh, Texas funding occurs on the county level, that the, the, our legislature has really pushed things down to the county. And so when it comes to schools, when it comes to hospitals, when it comes to those other services, they require often property taxes or other local taxes to pay for it, but then they'll put caps on those and they'll really restrict the ability of counties to actually raise the dollars that they need. We're, we're very much opposed to that. We, we think that the, the state should take a larger role in funding these, but if you're going to require counties to do it, you need to allow them to do that. They need to have local control that allows them to support the things that they want to support. Um, we talk about improving openness and transparency in the budget process. We do a lot of testifying. Um, CPPP is a, is a huge, they've traditionally been um, the, uh, the organization that have housed us. Um, Eva DeLuna and Dick Levine have been wonderful and amazing. We've had many other members sort of te testify in the areas that they um, are, are most interested in and, and knowledgeable about. And so one of the things we do is we put information about hearings, we put together uh, talking points that can be used in other people's testimony, and really hopefully um, we'll ask that our members do a lot of the kind of larger work of really talking about what needs to be part of the budget. As part of this upcoming session, we're going to be talking about um, opposing vouchers and other attempts to make private uses of public money, um, opposing a Medicaid block grant. You heard Ann Knuckleberg talk really eloquently all about the pieces of that, and that's something um, that, that we're not in support of. Um, opposing proposals to make state spending caps even more restrictive, and ensuring that cities, counties, and other types of local governments maintain the ability um, to invest in public services. Um, you can check out our website at txforward.org. If you're not a member, please email info at txforward.org. Again, our goal is to really bring our collective voices together. We'll be having a membership meeting uh, probably here in February. Um, we're about to bring on a new staff person. We're, we're currently in the process of acquiring that. And I think that'll really help with our social media, with our, our other outreach um, efforts in organization. So again, thank you all for the ability to talk today. Hey, thanks. So, uh, yeah, CTD has been involved with Texas Ford for quite a few years now. No, you know, some have been around about four, but, you know. Um, Kyle, Cole, come on, please. So I just want to say, if you're interested in the state appropriations, you should be interested in the state revenue advocacy section of this. And if you don't, you're missing the fluff that gets you the minus you want for your bank accounts to some, uh, some Kyle, come on up. All right, good afternoon, officially, everyone. I will be brief to make sure we're as much time as possible. I know a lot of us would like to connect with you guys. Uh, just quickly, um, I wanted to thank Dennis and the Coalition of Texas with Disabilities for bringing this together. If there's one thing I learned in my short political career is if you're not at the table, you're definitely on the menu. So thank you for letting us share our tables and invite people to it. Um, my name is Kyle Picola, and I'm with the ARC of Texas. The ARC advocates alongside and on behalf of individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Um, my counterpart, Ginger Mayo, is right there, um, and many of y'all know her as well. I like to joke that we're a mini department, but we're a mighty department. Uh, so give us a, an issue, and uh, if we have the time, we can take it on. Uh, 
Before I go into the State Supported Living Center idea, I just very quickly want to touch on an issue that was briefly mentioned, and that's sub-minimum wage. Uh, I just want to make clear that, you know, if you're earning less than minimum wage, that's not an opportunity. Uh, it's a cycle of poverty <laughs> and isolation. Um, the lowest paid Texan earns one penny an hour right here in the state. Uh, so that's why the ARC launched Texas Works for All in November, and it's a coalition of Texas employers who, like the ARC of Texas, believe that everyone deserves to earn minimum wage or higher. You can visit texasworksforall.com. Uh, we encourage all of you guys to join. Um, we'll be rolling out uh, that as session goes into, uh, into effect. Um, so I'm here to talk about the state supported living centers or the state schools. Uh, this is my first session in Texas, and uh, jokingly, I, I probably took on one of the most challenging issues out there. Um, but to me, uh, looking at it and to sum it up briefly, it's really a supply and demand <laughs> issue. Um, if you look at the census and the demand for SSLC services over the past 15 years, uh, they've declined rapidly. Uh, in fact, just um, since 2008, the census has declined by 35% and it's projected to decline another 45% by 2019. However, uh, the state of Texas has not closed or consolidated one of these institutions since 1995, I believe. Um, and so we're supporting 13 of these facilities for just uh, projected just over 2,900 people, while there's 111,000 unduplicated people sitting up to 12 years waiting for these very important services to help them be independent, uh, find employment, um, get personal attendance that they can find one that pays for. Um, just a few statistics that I'd like to leave you with uh, and to keep it brief. Um, so only 0.2% of the population actually lives in all these institutions, yet 40% of the budget that um, is spent on individuals with IDD uh, goes to, to just 3,000 individuals. Um, one of the things that we're launching this session is don't myth with Texas, and a lot of times we hear a lot of myths about this issue. Um, one of them being, uh, you know, we need those facilities because they house the most medically complex individuals, physically complex. Um, and according to the state, that is a big myth. In fact, under 16% of people who actually live in uh, the, the centers are uh, deemed pervasive, uh, or 52% um, are a level of need one or five, which is little to no support. Um, which is really unfortunate that uh, we hear all the time from the state that uh, you know these facilities really are mandatory because we have that population. Another myth about the state supported living centers is that uh, you know the community can't support individuals who um, have really complex medical, physical, uh, or behavior support needs. And according to the state, that's also a myth. Um, there are eight times as many individuals living in the community with the highest levels of needs than there are in the state supported living centers currently. Uh, so. Our path forward, we believe, uh, is a balanced approach. We want to take a look at the system, a uh, compassionate look at the system, uh, rebalance it to really put those limited resources where the demand is, and it's clear that that demand is in the community. Uh, there's currently a zero wait list to uh, go into a state supported living center. The 11, 111,000 individuals are choosing to wait up to 12, 15 years to get services. Um, like, Everyone here, please uh, feel free to join this cause. If you go to architexas.org, you can follow us. You can. Um, we just are launching an advocacy action center uh, with all of our uh, le le legislative priorities. Uh, it'll list where they are in the process and if there's an action that you can take. Uh, thank you and have a great day, guys. So I just want to point out that uh, among our people in the room today is Linda Parrish, who was appointed by Governor Ann Richards last time there was a, a closure of a state of twice appointed? Two closures. And if I'm not mistaken, Linda, at that time it was supposed to be an ongoing process as the demand for these institutions declined. However, I have a report. I'll share it with you. It says that it was actually 
Exactly. So what has happened instead is these institutions have continued to remain open. And this is tied into what Will was saying about money. You know, if we, if we throw away money on hugely expensive institutions, which are less than a half full, frankly, probably less than a third full. I mean, your capacity was once 12,000, now there's three, 75% empty. Well, we have over 100,000 people who qualify for institutionalization but prefer to stay on a wait list for community services for 12 years. What kind of decisions are we really making? Not the best. So uh, speaking of really smart things we should be doing with money, Judy Tellers is going to talk about relocation contracts uh, operated by community-based organizations. And by the way, we're down to just one, one group after Judy. Thank you, Dennis. Hi everybody, nice to see so many people that I haven't seen in a while. Glad you're all here, we have lots to do as always. Mm -hmm. My name is Judy Tilge and I live in Corpus Christi where I work at the Coastal Men's Center for Independent Living, an organization that I uh, was one of three to found several years ago. I'm no longer executive director but I'm still engaged and kind of uh, trying to help out with efforts that have been underway for the past few months by Centers for Independent Living in Texas, in addition to COIL out of San Antonio, a community-based organization. Um, all of us have a commonality that is uh, very troubling. Um, what has happened with the legislative budget uh, uh, recommendation from HHSC has been to not fund the relocation contracts, the relocation services contracts that have been so successful for so many years through DADS. As we all know, DADS has now folded into HHSC uh, as has many of the services that have been provided. Well. We, Centers for Independent Living, and by the way, that's really being spearheaded by a group called Texil, which is uh, the folks that uh, are out in front of the legislature, out in front of uh, uh, local folks doing advocacy, because for those of you who don't know, we do have advocacy among our core services. Uh, not lobbying, of course. It's the educating and, and making people aware. Um, and we also have four other core services, one of which is transition. This is something relatively new under WIOA, and it bears very uh, importantly into this issue about relocation services uh, not being funded at the tune of $5 million in the next two uh, years. We find this extremely troubling also because there is no attempt at asking um, to change that budget request from HHSC. Despite um, a visit recently, we have had a sit down with the executive leadership. Um, and some of the information that came out of that sit down is also troubling. However, being what we are and needing to um, continue with providing services to people with disabilities in Texas, throughout Texas, the Centers for Independent Living are proceeding with the legislative advocacy. And here's why that's so important. It's important because all these contracts have done so much good. I think, Mark, you know that Texas has been number one in something over the years, and that was in getting people out of institutions, something that we all put lip service into throughout the country, that yes, this is important to do for many reasons. People want to live in the community. People should have choice as to where they live, and it is something that makes sense from a fiscal standpoint. <coughs> well, 
what, what we have identified as centers is we can cover, and dads realize this and HHSC has realized this, we can cover the entire state of Texas, not just with our own networks, which is centers primarily uh, receiving funding under contracts and then subcontracting with other entities, most likely SILs throughout, throughout the state. Well, we serve our communities. We are on the ground with people who need the services, with the families, with the caregivers, with the attendants. So our legislative strategy is what we all know is important. Polit it's politics, working. politics, all politics is local. Every one of these legislators has a home to live in. Every one of them needs to know the impact of decisions like what we're facing by taking money out of relocation services and putting it, we just find out that money's not going away. It's there somewhere. Where's Will? Where did he go? I wanna, boy, do I want to talk with you. <laughs> Don't you go away. Um, so what we did find out also, which is important, and I think it's important for us to carry this message to our local legislators is the thought is that Centers for Independent Living in doing <coughs> relocation services, is, it is redundant. Ever heard that before? Mm -hmm. Relative to managed care organizations. Redundant, okay. Obviously somebody who came up with that does not know the difference between a medical model and a consumer model of direct service provision. They obviously don't know the difference between how, and believe me, we work together. One has to work together, the, the consumer uh, driven model and the medical model, as well as all the other aspects of helping people move into the community. We have to work together and we do. We've, we've shown that that's a good valid uh, arrangement. But the uh, answer then becomes, and I think it goes back into what Ann was talking about earlier, what is Texas going to do with Medicaid? The thought probably is, how do we make relocation a part of the managed care system? We know as centers, we know as advocates, that that is not necessarily an effective way of continuing to do what we've done so successfully. And we've heard the comment made, we don't know if it's gonna work. We hope it does. We think it might. We just have to figure out how to do it. And of course our stance is absolutely making no sense as to whether or not it's going to work when you've got people's lives basically at risk. We know what's important with that as well is the issues relative to uh, adequate uh, uh, salaries and wages and compensation. So that just goes hand in hand with it. So Silk, the SILs, our friends, <coughs> our allies are joining together. We wanna join with our friends and allies for the other issues that obviously are very much a part of that. But let me just tell you something really quickly. Part of our problem is <clears throat> there's data out there, but it's not cohesive. We have unfortunately found that dads didn't really uh, capture data about relocation until recently, electronic data. And apparently the paper <coughs> data uh, can be found. So what we have, is going back to the individual centers. Well, that's what we're gonna use because we know what we've got now, we know what we've submitted, and then we do have some data. I will, show, I will just quickly let you know that two numbers from 2013 to 2016, and this may be in a roundabout, the number of relocations accomplished was over 4,000. That's in a three-year time span. 
The number of completed assess uh, assessments is over double that, 9,660. That's how many people got assessed. Then you double that number and you get the number of people who are interested in relocating. That's pretty much the way it shakes out. So, some numbers that were put together by our partner COIL uh, relative to cost-benefit analysis. Texas pays Medicaid costs to nursing facility uh, just about $80,000 per year. Texas pays Medicaid costs for the relocation services almost $33,000 per year. So just those two numbers, the savings is $47,600 per year. And that's not talking about the savings on an annual basis, <clears throat> and it's not talking about over the aggregate. So if we want to look at cost benefit, we want to look at economic good sense, good business, then there needs to be a change. And we think that we can get these mentors with your help, with others' help, um, to make that change. Thank you very much. Okay, we just have one more uh, group speaking, and I guess you gather by now, not one group, not the initial issues we put forward through for the subsequent 11 folks have come in with their hands out saying, give me, give me, give me. It's all about either doing the right thing or actually doing smart things that not only don't cost money, but save money and or keep people healthy, which is about saving money. I love Judith's comment about after they eliminated the contract, that don't worry, all will figure out how to make it work. Well, you know what? If you don't support people to figure out how to make it work, the likelihood of them somehow find, finding other means to support themselves to subsidize the state's multi-billion dollar health and human service commission, very unlikely, very unlikely. So, um, mothers advocating for medical marijuana, I met these folks a couple years ago, and everybody said at that time, yeah, passing any kind of marijuana legalization, even medical in Texas, is a non-starter. Well, they did. They did. The first medical marijuana bill was passed and signed by Governor Abbott, but once said he would never sign such a bill. So this is our last one. Amy and Dahlia, are you, I know Amy's here. Just you, Amy, this time? Okay, so um, come on up. I, you know, I felt so much respect for this group of ladies who are mothers who took on their children's interests and battled the state. And you know, you fought the law and you won, right? <laughs> I feel very honored to be a part of this group and humbled and I always cry when I talk so I just get that out of the way. I don't know why, I'm just tired, I think. Um, <laughs> um, I hope that what I talk to you about can touch all of your lives. It touches our life and I see many people helped by cannabis. Where Mama is a, actually a mother's advocating medical <coughs> marijuana for autism we're autism moms, and uh, uh, we're a grassroots parent advocacy group. Primary goal is the legalization of whole plant medical marijuana with autism as a qualifying condition in Texas and the United States. We believe that marijuana, cannabis, we try to call it, is safe. Clearly it's safe, it has thousands of years safety record, um, and has the potential to help many, if not most, children with autism. <coughs> That's an important thing these days when you look at the rates of autism. Um, although autism is our main focus, we are for all the patients that need this plant. And for the record, we are not here for recreational. We are from Texas and uh, we're just doing medical. <laughs> um, to summarize the last session in one word, it would be unprecedented. Essentially, three medical bills were assigned to committee and got a hearing. The low THC bill, the comprehensive whole plant medical bill, and an affirmative defense bill. 
Other cannabis reform bills were filed and made similar progress. Despite overwhelming, overwhelmingly positive testimony on all the bills, very few dissenters, only one medical bill got to a vote, but history was made when the low THC bill became law, and it's now the Texas Compassionate Use Program, or called TICA. I want to back up a little bit before I go on and do some Cannabis 101 education for everybody. Um, the cannabis plant is made up of cannabinoids, terpenes, and flavonoids. It's the cannabinoid that's unique to the cannabis plant. Terpenes are what you smell in essential oils. Um, all together, they work all together synergistically, and this is called the entourage effect or we call it the whole plant. The teacup does allow for whole plant as long as THC is below certain levels, and right now that is put at 0.5% THC, but otherwise does not restrict the other components of the plant. It is for intractable epilepsy only, the teacup, which is certainly a foot in the door. The program is due to be fully functional no later than September 2017. In the House, when they voted, 116 legislators voted in favor and 34 against. Of the 34 who voted against, one was a Democrat. Uh, woo, if anybody's in his district. Um, of the Republicans, four were Tea Partiers and two others are on the record for other important medical freedoms. I find that interesting um, with the Tea Party in there, lean towards freedom issues. Um, the most positive takeaway is that well over 100 Republican legislators are on the record for saying that cannabis is indeed medicine. Putting THC back in changes nothing for our purposes. It will still be medicine and it will still be safe. There's been some issues with implementing the teacup that we're working through. Um, they started to, for some reason, they decided to require state trooper presence 24-7 and that led to massive fee increases. What was $6,000 um, for, a, for um, a registration fee became $1.2 million for a dispensary to open. There's been one hearing um, where things are changing and there will be frequent inspections instead of 24 seven presence by two troopers. Fees have, were knocked down by half to $500,000 um, with a renewal fee every other year of 400000 about $400,000. So that obviously still needs to change, and there will be one more hearing. Hopefully in the next hearing they can restore closer to the original fees. The implementation of teacup is incredibly important for future medical bills, and Mama continues to support these moms who are fighting for their children. Looking forward, Mama's wish list for expanding the teacup is as follows. No limits on THC include autism and many, many more qualifying conditions. In fact, it would be nice if it would just be up to a doctor's discretion for debilitating conditions, but, um, and several states do have that. I don't see that happening in Texas. Uh, we'd also like home grow with enough plants allowed to be able to juice our medicine. A girl can dream. <laughs> Clearly, the big battle this is, I'm sorry, I must be really tired. I'm no, so weak. You're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> the big battle is going to be about limiting THC percentages. That's where they're going to knock this bill down. They're going to say, okay, we'll let you have a little more THC. I know that asking for no limits on THC goes well beyond a baby step strategy. But what's not the answer is to increase THC incrementally. And this is why. Autism is epidemic, and nothing I've seen helps like cannabis helps. And my son is 17, and we've been chasing every single thing out there. Nothing helps like cannabis can help these kids. Pharma is not our friend. There are exactly two FDA-approved drugs that are um, for autism irritability or behaviors. Those drugs come with massive side effects, possibly permanent side effects, and um, black box warnings, and lots of lawsuits. These drugs, Risperdal and Abilify, are recommended routinely to children as young as two. 
The CDC estimates that 1% of the population in the United States has autism or is on the spectrum. Let's extrapolate that to Texas. That's 260,000 Texans with autism. Another way to look at it, one in 68 children or one in 49 boys. Certain estimates say that it will be one in two children by the year 2025 if things don't change. Research tells us that well over half of these people exhibit aggression and self-injurious behavior. That's 130,000 Texans with an incredibly poor quality of life, and plus their family. The situation is dire. CBD versus THC, it's not good versus evil. Both are medicinal. Please remember that according to government-owned patent 6630507, <laughs> THC and CBD are similarly neuroprotective. They're neuroprotective. They're not hurting these brains. What really hurts brains are these drugs that they put our children on instead, the psychotropics and others. What really hurts our children are seizures. What really hurts our children is being autistic and stuck in a loop for years of talking about one thing. That hurts. When it comes to CBD and THC, the ratios that work for epilepsy, which are high CBD to low THC, are flip-flopped. For autism, when violent behaviors are an issue, we need high THC and low CBD. Limiting the percentage of THC renders medical cannabis useless for these kids in this population. Mama gets messages daily from parents out of hope from Texas and around the world and whose only option is mail order CBD. Yet CBD heavy strains can aggravate autism. It agitates my child and others like him. On the other hand, THC is a rescue med for seizures and is potentially a rescue med for autism meltdowns and there's no drug that can stop an autism meltdown in its tracks. Children in nearby states are using these THC strains with amazing, amazing success. There are 28 states in this country that allow whole plant medical marijuana. Two of them now include autism, which is a step forward from the last time I spoke here, or Talia spoke here. So why, why do we need to increase THC to the full capacity? Because how long are our kids supposed to wait? My child is 17. Is he supposed to wait for another two years and another two years until they titrate up the amount of THC when I know that he needs, um, he, he really needs that? Mothers are taking matters into their own hands and risking everything to help their children. Texas is losing great people to Colorado, to drugs, to death, and to jail. Uh, over the weekend, a story broke about a mother in northern Texas who has epilepsy. The drugs that they were giving her weren't working. She was taking cannabis. She was also breastfeeding. She had a grand mal when she was coming off of her last seizure med, which I think is not unusual. Um, she told them that she was using cannabis oil. They tested the child that she's breastfeeding. They took her children for five and a half months, five children took them from her home for five and a half months and the parents are facing jail time. Do you know that we have, there are endogenous cannabinoids in mother's milk and yet they're testing for it. So this session, we are way ahead of the game compared to last session. A whole plant comprehensive medical bill has already been filed by Senator Menendez to expand the teacup and it's Senate Bill 269. This bill puts no limits on THC. It allows for many debilitating conditions, cancer, things we've spoken about today, issues that we have today, cancer, MS, Crohn's, colitis, agitation due to Alzheimer's disease, PTSD, autism, spinal cord disease and injury, Parkinson's, muscular dystrophy, and many more. It allows for home grow, it protects doctors, and establishes plant quality standards. It's a good bill. There is a precedent. Florida recently became the first state to upgrade from a CBD only state, which is what Texas is, to a whole plant state. Since 76% of Texans believe medical marijuana should be legal for seriously ill patients, we've got some steps to take to get this done. 
there's some education. One thing, for example, that people are confused about, including legislators, is what cannabis oil is. CBD oil is only one type of cannabis oil, like lavender is one type of essential oil. As a result, though, of the teacup, legislators think we already have a medical marijuana bill because we have cannabis oil, but any strain can be made into an oil. It's just a method of delivery. Legislators need to be reassured. The fears of many conservatives is that we will go from medical to decrim to full legalization. Recreational is not inevitable just because we open the door to medical. Every state that has added recreational has the ballot initiative system, and we don't. The legislators have the power to write the bill that we follow. When it becomes law, the teacup being implemented will not end the world as we know it, and expanding it will not undo its importance or purpose. Obviously, we need Republicans to support and sponsor this bill, to get it to committee, to keep it intact, and move it through the process until it can reach the governor's desk. I don't know if there will be other medically sound bills, but if they include autism and THC, we're in. We also need an affirmative defense bill, because if, de if a decrim bill does pass, it won't necessarily help patients who are using oils. Decrim is more for an ounce or two of flour. We need, government, we need to help Governor Abbott walk back his statement that he will not allow medical marijuana in Texas. He's, he still says that after he signed the teacup. This is, that's it. He's just going to do this. We need to respectfully let him know that he does not have all the information. He does not know us, and he doesn't know our kids. Thank you, Amy. So I would say from the many hearings that testified on bills left last session, the most powerful was Amy's bill on medical marijuana, where there were parents who had moved their families to Colorado to treat their children. There were parents who talked about conducting criminal acts to provide medicine for their children, who of course were them themselves committing criminal acts by taking that medicine. Um, I also found out that uh, the Texas Silver Hair Legislature, and I tested it, is, and I think one of their top 10 issues is top 10, top 10 medical marijuana. I know I met up with them last session, and the um, Texas chapter of the Paralyzed Veterans of America also were in favor of it. So old folks, people with disabilities, mothers, and veterans, and probably a lot more supported. So we'll be with you, Amy. So that kind of, that concludes our formal thing. We have the room till one. I know the speakers went on a little bit long. To those on Facebook, uh, this will be archived on our Facebook page, and you can watch it or tell others about it. It's at uh, Facebook slash TX Disabilities. I want to thank you all for coming. This uh,